very lucky to be at this place. Uh, and I know that for several different reasons, not only because of Mary Martin McLaughlin. First, you have Carol Levin, who is here as an extraordinary teacher scholar, one of the most renowned scholars in Renaissance studies today, although we don't like to talk use that word, early modern, we might say. Uh, but also, I found out only in common rival uh, that Carol's own office is an old father hall, uh, which is named actually for the great grandson for my husband's uh, 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 great uncle, uh, who uh, Charles Oldfather, the father of the old father, who was the uh, uh, was the lawyer uh, here, was once the uh, a professor of, of Latin and a professor of classics and, and of history uh, in his time at uh, at Nebraska. And uh, there's an old tradition in this family, half of which is called Adams, and the other half called Old Father. You know, this is, might be a little bit too um, patriarchal for you, uh, but uh, you have this uh, the sense that there's a, a great tradition of Americans who came to places like Nebraska, and this family particularly went to Illinois and Nebraska, in order to work on things like Latin and Greek, uh, writing famous dictionaries of Latin and Greek and uh, being dedicated their whole lives to the study of, of classics. Mary told me the best training she ever received in classics was at the University of, uh, of Nebraska. And I know that also because the man who is in charge of the medieval Latin dictionary project at Oxford is also a graduate of the University of Nebraska uh, in, uh, in classics and, and history. So uh, there's a long tradition here of extraordinarily beautifully educated uh, people in, in earlier literatures and, and histories, and I hope as well, that of course every day would want to maintain, ex amplify, extend, so that there are more and more people who are teaching classics and medieval studies, and uh, all those earlier disciplines which actually are the state of our future and the salvation of our, uh, of our civilization. Did I make that point clearly enough? Uh, okay. so, I heard it. Uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, thank you so much for welcoming me here. Mary Martin McLaughlin was an eminent medieval historian who spent most of her life practicing as a private scholar. Uh, she was able, she came from Grand Island, uh, and as befits a child of the Northern Plains, Mary McLaughlin was born into a very cosmopolitan merchant family of April 15th of 1919, guarded her independence and her privacy, balancing her fierce capacities of mind and word with a gentle demeanor and exquisite courtesy. She was a superb professional colleague, open to all and condescending to none. Her strongest remark, as her friends noted, was usually, ah, well. But she had no compunction about scolding loudly any malefactor, and I think this is probably what she was doing when, any malefactor, especially of the political variety, whom she observed on public television's nightly news. You can imagine, since I live in Texas, what it was like to know her between the years 2000 and 2008. <laughs> How many early evening phone calls I received from her uh, about the 2000 to 2008 United States president that began with something, a sputter of that man, and ended with, ah, well. <laughs> uh, she was a deeply thoughtful friend. It's hard to imagine how she found time to do the kind of academic work she did because the world constantly knocked on her doors in Millbrook and she opened her door to the encumbrances as well as the pleasures of companionship and collegiality. Everyone was always impressed by how up-to-date Mary was in terms of her scholarship. Uh, she was someone right to the end who was on top of the recent literature and absolutely sharp in her critical abilities. I don't know anyone who seems to have had a better grip on rising young people in her field or was ready to put out a helping hand. The Nuns Project alone, which she started at Barnard University uh, in the 70s, gave needed employment to several young women who were then struggling with the job crisis. There were no jobs, uh, and she created this whole academy of, of study of, uh, of medieval uh, religious women, medieval women religious, in order to make it possible for, for, for these women to be studied, but also for women to continue to study. Uh, so she was an extraordinary, uh, dedicated person, able to bring resources to bear on questions she cared about a great deal. She was a magnificent botanist. And as I said, we Americans, medievalists, owe much to rigorous early classics teachers who spread across our multicultural land. They not only drilled the young in Latin grammar and rhetoric, but also inspired them with delight classical literature and history. 
Mary was lucky in her teachers. She had five Latin teachers as a girl and as an advanced student at the Latin Grant University of Nebraska, where we are here, for which she graduated with an AB in 1940 and uh, an AM in 1941. She moved east to New York, studying at Columbia University from 1941 to 43, and then taught at two of the seven sister schools at Wellesley from 1943 to 45, and then at Vassar from 1945 to 48. And you might think then that she would simply have gone on to a career at one of the Seven Sisters schools, which were the place where someone with her kind of education normally went to that point. Instead, she decided she was going to return home to the University of Nebraska to teach as she finished writing her dissertation. Columbia awarded her the PhD in history in 1952 for a book called Intellectual Freedom and Its Limitations in the University of Paris, 13th and 14th century which she finally released for publication a quarter century later, absolutely unchanged in 1977, to excellent reviews. She again dedicated herself briefly to teaching at Vassar from 1958 to 65, but even that lovely place was too constricting to allow her the mental space to follow her scholarly interests. After an aggregate of, a mixed aggregate of 22 years of teaching, she retired to an elegantly snug historic home in Millbrook, New York, uh, in which she took, undertook uh, her work as an independent scholar. She had, of course, the distinction of many different kinds of fellowships and private wealth, uh, and, uh, and, and yet, at the same time, uh, we know that she was a kind of person who would never be entirely uh, happy in ordinary academic life, uh, what she called institutional servitude. Uh, she would, I think, have called the scholar's life, even one of the impoverishments, uh, something that was preferable. Uh, she described herself actually not as an independent scholar, although she was. That is, she, uh, she was well enough funded privately so that she didn't have to uh, uh, just work for a living in some ordinary way. But she called herself the most dependent of all scholars because she was always depending on collaboration in various forms, starting with what she said was the footnote, the symbol as well as the vehicle of our dependence. Remember that when you're writing your papers. Why, we, why is it that we always insist that you provide us with footnotes? Because we want to know that you've entered into a conversation, uh, that you're part of a conversation with all of the scholars who have ever worked on the field, and that was exactly what Mary felt. And her, co her collaborations were small and large. They forcefully shaped the field of medieval studies. I just need to tell you that Mary's first two books uh, that were published were uh, prompted by Viking Press she collaborated with another woman at Vassar on something called the Portable Medieval Reader, which came out in 1949. It is still in print. She collaborated next on one called the Renaissance Reader in 1953. And each of these provided in a very classical Ivy League fashion these uh, collections of sources and very <coughs> primary texts intended for general readers as well as for students and organized uh, appropriate interpretive categories. And she says that for her, it's all greatly enlarged her acquaintance. But one of the things that's amazing is that it is the way that people like me, perhaps even like Carol, they first have come uh, to know anything about the Middle Ages. These are, these are extraordinary texts, and, uh, but could, could only have been provided, I think, by supple, a very supple Latinist. Uh, and uh, it was, had been when Mary died, uh, the Portable Medieval Reader had been continuously in print for 57 years, now for more than 60. Amazing as an achievement for a, uh, an, an academic book. Mary was au courant to her bones, but it meant that she also found herself, when she was in disagreement with some scholar, in a state of great perplexity and uh, disabling perplexity, the kind of thing that may happen to you when you're in the middle of writing a paper and you say, but I think I'm disagreeing with someone who may make sense, and I have to figure out why that person doesn't make sense. How do I know that what I'm saying makes sense? And she spent 40 years of her life working on her biography of Eloise, asking herself all those questions as she went along. Uh, she focused increasingly not on the story of Abelard and Eloise, but on Eloise's work and life as separate from that of Abelard. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, but she found herself unable to finish this work, uh, unable to let go of this. There was always another another Latin verb that might have a slightly different resonance if it were uh, translated in a different way, and still would, had I not just decided finally that we would put it to bed and, and, uh, and, and bring it to press. 
But we also know that she's somebody who opened up other fields. Have any of you read about studying medieval children? She was the first person to write about medieval children. Uh, and an extraordinary, rich, huge range of material that she brought to bear on this. And from that, she won the Berkshire Prize uh, of the Conference of Women Historians in 1975. She began the study, really. She was the first person anyone knows who called, talked about women's history as a separate field. The term itself, women's history, may be one that Mary herself actually invented. And, uh, and we know that there are so many different kinds of collaborative projects that she undertook that have ended up in huge digital uh, archive collections uh, mounted like the one uh, called uh, Monastic Matrix, uh, which is at USC now. But that doesn't mean that she was someone who ever became comfortable with a computer. So if there's anything to learn is keep up with technology because otherwise, like Mary, you might find that you spend five years of your life just trying to figure out how to make the difference between a document in Word Perfect and one in Word uh, merge with each other. And uh, so don't let the software defeat you because it certainly defeated her. One of the things that I like best about Mary's legacy, and I hope part of it will be coming to, the, uh, to this university, uh, is, uh, is that Mary, uh, gave all of her books, she had a huge collection, she had a private library that would rival that of most institutions in the world in terms of uh, medieval uh, studies and history. And she gave, left all of her books to a young woman scholar who's going to be starting out working in a small college which did not have the resources to provide her with the scholarly work that she needed in order to do just all the work she needed to do her own research. That is the kind of impulse, I think, that, that marked uh, the kind of generosity and spirit of Mary McLaughlin. It's sweet solace uh, to know that she left her in books that way. Uh, it was sweet solace for me also to know Mary as a very dear friend, uh, the kind of person with whom you fall in love when you study Latin. Be careful about studying Latin with anyone, any gender. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. It is really good uh, to work, as I remember, especially a Thanksgiving weekend that my husband and I spent with Mary. Um, she had worried over the arrangements and her household clutter and the menu. Only after her feast, as we faced the bones and the washing up, did we all admit to each other that we found turkey to be a kind of optional part of the holiday. And only then did Mary admit that while Turkey wandered on her lovely acres and she had paled at the idea of eating one. After that, her dining room table found its best use as a collected desk covered with flurries of notes, voices mixed exuberantly as we tried alternate translations of 12th century texts. You can't imagine how much fun it is. And in the company of these two consummate Latinists who prowled like lions over texts, I knew sheer joy, the genuine article. Uh, much better than food actually could ever be. Mary ended her autobiographical remarks several years ago with this statement about her view of the historian's dilemma. Although we can know from the correspondence in their other works a good deal about the experience and aspirations of Eloise and Abelard, especially during a single decade, the 1130s, we still find ourselves able to learn less and less. And finally, in this case, as in so many others, we're confronted by that silence of which W.H. Auden reminds us in a few lines of his homage to Cleo. Remember, Cleo is, of course, the uh, uh, news of, of the historians. But we, says Auden, at haphazard and unseasonably are brought face to face by once, Cleo, with your silence. That's what I wanted to say to you about Mary Martin Welcome, an extraordinary woman, a great Nebraskan, someone who held on to her roots here in Nebraska, cared deeply about the education she received here, respected it enormously, uh, and, uh, and never lost faith with the notion uh, that, that one could have a, a very great uh, education, uh, no matter uh, whether one had decided to stay inside or outside, whichever league one, one